I'm proud to stand before you on the motion that this house would apologize for colonialism. My brothers and sisters, a specter is haunting planet Earth. It's an evil, nagging ghost that will not go away. It is the ghost of colonialism and the neo-colonialism that has taken its place. It must be dispatched, and at a minimum, it must be recognized and apologized for. It is time for us to raise our hands and to say it was us, and that we are truly sorry. Our model is quite simple. We believe that every nation that ever had a colony needs to apologize to that colony without reservations or conditions. We believe that apology is an appropriate response. In an interpersonal situation, all of us has done wrong. And all of us need to learn to apologize for the wrong that we have done. As communities, we must do the same. We recognize that in difficult situations like that in South Africa, a reconciliation process has helped to resolve and soothe the situation. Not solving and eliminating, but making the situation better. No, oh, thank you. The guilty hear their crimes. The guilty beg for forgiveness. It has led to reinstatement without excessive remorse, and it has avoided revenge and retaliation. I would like to preview our arguments. First, we should apologize for crimes against people. Second, we should apologize for crimes against the land. Third, we should apologize for crimes against China. My colleague, Ridian, will be extending our case and arguing that the burden of colonialism as reflected in current neo-colonialism creates anger and disaster all around the world. Our first argument, we should apologize for crimes against people. Yes, sir. Why should the sons and daughters of the people who ages ago colonized these countries take the hint and the guilt from their actions? I believe that we are the successors of our parents and our grandparents. I believe we exist in a direct lineage with the past. You, sir, may want to stand as an atomized, isolated individual. We stand in the current of history and appreciate our place. Our first argument, we will apologize for crimes against people. Enslavement, extermination, the native peoples of North and South America Millions and millions of them exterminated by germs, by diseases, by the guns they did not have. Slavery, my brothers and sisters, is the largest human rights crime in the history of the world. And it was carried out specifically against the African people in the instance of colonialism. In Africa, the legacy of King Leopold lives on in the Congo yes. and everywhere else. He collected the hands of those who didn't agree with him, chopped them off, and smoked them, and kept them as grim trophies. He collected families and said, unless you harvest rubber and ivory, I will kill your children. And when they brought the rubber and ivory back, they were still killed. This specter still haunts us in Rwanda and Burundi, for example. We hear about the genocide between the Hutus and the Tutsis. What we may not know is that they are not different ethnic groups. They are the same ones. They were divided by the Belgians into a ruling class and a ruled class. Yes. And it wasn't until the 20th century that that harvest 
came to be. I'll take your point, Okay, madam. sir, but you have to recognize the fact that the apology is not going directly to the victim, does not reparate the fact what has been done to the victims themselves. So you're in, uh, in accordance with that, you're not apologizing. Yes, yes, yes. Physical. I'm sure that in your interpersonal relations, you never apologize for what you did wrong. And the apology <laughs> never, and the apology <laughs> never <laughs> eliminates the crime. But show me what is wrong with apology. Show me that confronting reality is wrong. And if you believe ignoring heinous reality is right, vote for them. Our second argument, we apologize for crimes against the land. The maps that were drawn by the colonial powers, the lands that were chopped up randomly in a divide and conquer strategy, set the stage today for wars we see in the Middle East endless conflict in Africa, the threat of re the theft of resources, gold, diamonds, rubber, tin, all the natural resources the colonial po powers wanted. We got the profit, they got the piles of waste that were left over, and as a consequence, they feel lucky to be able to sort through the rubbish tips of modernity because most of their wealth has all been robbed. Point. My third point, Crimes against China. China has been, through most of human history, the most developed and the largest civilization on Earth. Yet, in a window of opportunity, when the West had the guns, they brought them to heel. The opium wars, the forced trade, corruption of their institutions, spawned people like Mao, who were able to kill 80 million of his own people. And even now, these consequences remain as China distrusts the West and sets the stage for using our own tactics against the world, whether from Myanmar to Darfur. Apology is always better than silence. Apology is always better than denial. On bended knee, with tears in our eyes, we must beg for forgiveness. For the crimes done, not by me, but in my name. Yes. I'm not afraid to say sorry for what was done in my name. Against the, the mockery and the murder that continues in the world, spawned by colonialism, the best thing to do is set the stage for a new approach. We must apologize so that we can move on. I urge you to propose. Thank you very much for that speech. Now I'd like to call upon the leader of the opposition from Team Croatia to speak for seven minutes. Dobro večer, dama i gospodo. No, we're Croatian. <laughs> I, uh, I first went to Croatia yesterday and I love it very much. I actually tripped over in Slovenia, it was an accident. Um, and I, I'm seeking reparation from your government uh, for leaving this town in the way. Um, right, the problem with the proposition is not the rhetoric or the sentiment. We agree that terrible things have happened all the way throughout human history, and not only by white people, but by people of all colours. And this apology, this extraordinary apology that is proposed by the proposition, involves, and I quote, every nation that ever had a colony. When challenged on a point of information, we were told that he's atomized, and therefore we are all people who are the excess successors of oppressors at some stage in human history, except Chinese people, whose empire apparently didn't oppress anyone. Um, so we're left with everyone except the Chinese apologizing. So who's we? Who are we? And who are they? And I did that for him, obviously. This, this is the biggest group therapy session ever. And it, and it makes no effect at all on anyone, except, and I say this with the greatest respect, some people feeling better about themselves because they can excuse themselves for the acts of other people for which they feel irrationally responsible. And we don't believe that's a way to conduct international affairs. So we don't apologise. I'm sorry, we're not going to. <laughs> Very English, isn't it? <laughs> we, we have five problems with this initially. 
Uh, they all start with I. Number one is inappropriate, uh, Mr. Speaker, or Madam Speaker, in fact. We think that a historical judgment about these matters only invites a cycle of people feeling that they can demand apologies for other people for events that happened in the past that may not uh, be their responsibility. Let's look at Zimbabwe, where Robert Mugabe is, has destroyed that country while blaming Britain for it, because in the past, Britain did terrible things in Zimbabwe, as if his policies have nothing to do with the rampant hyperinflation and the human rights abuses, not at this time, that he is responsible for. So it's totally inappropriate to say sorry to Robert Mugabe for the things that he's doing. It's insincere, it's vacuous and hypocritical and will invite scorn, no thank you, from the international community. The idea that all the white people stand up and say, we're really sorry, we're keeping all the money, but we deeply apologise. We think that's, that's an atrocious cant from that side of the house. Yes. Okay, so you have a problem with Mugabe using Britain as his justification. By apologising to yeah, Zimbabwe yeah. for the crimes that Britain committed, we remove that justification and they see Mugabe for what he is. Absolutely not, because everyone's having to apologise. The idea that there's any sort of distinction or merit in your apology when it comes alongside apologies from the Scots, the Welsh, dare I say, and everyone else. This isn't a proper apology that means anything. Everyone in this room all stands up and points at this side and says, you're rubbish, just because I tell them to. That doesn't mean anything. It's just that they've been told to by your proposition and that they've been told to by me. It wouldn't have any meaning, it wouldn't have any significance, and it wouldn't be fair. So let's look at the third problem. It's imprudent. It could lead to damages claims from people across the world and a set millions of cases coming up before courts saying, well, okay, you've admitted you were wrong, therefore we would like damages for the wrong that you've done us. Counterclaim. This isn't a recipe for peace. It's a recipe for wars based on arguments about history when we should be trying to face the future. And we think that's a bad plan as well. No, thank you. We think, furthermore, it's ill-directed. It's not helping the victims, as Branka told you on a point of information. It's helping ourselves because we can wring our hands of the problems. Why should we give development aid to African countries? We've said sorry. What more do they want? Why, why should we feel any moral responsibility? No, thank you. It's because we feel that moral responsibility that we go to the Live 8 concert and we put our hands in our pocket. And we, absolutely. And we've raised the level of aid in Britain that we've paid by 400% in the last 10 years, Mr Speaker. That's what we do. And it's because we feel guilt as populations that we pressure our governments to do so. No, thank you. Fifthly, it's ill-advised. Again. There are countries... No, the last one was ill-directed. You have to keep up. <laughs> it's ill-advised. <laughs> there are countries all across the world who are using anti-colonialist rhetoric as an excuse for the policies that they're following. So we're inviting stagnation. We are saying to countries, if you pursue the path that you are now of robbing your own people and continuing to do that and blaming someone else, that that is a path which we will reward you for with an apology. And I don't see how Ridian's point deals with that, and I'd like to hear him do so. Lastly, it's irresponsible. It sends the message that words are enough. And when you think of the terrible crimes that are going on in the world recently, you think of no thank you. We think of what's happened in the former Yugoslavia. We think of the war crimes tribunals that are happening now, places like Rwanda, no thank you. The idea that a simple apology rather than justice through crimes being tried at tribunals, no thank you, is the right way to go, is an appalling one. And it will be picked up on as an excuse by those people who have perpetrated those crimes recently. What you are doing is drawing no distinction between crimes of the distant past, which are encompassed by their proposal, potentially going back to 4000 BC or further where historical records exist, and this isn't me being silly, this is actually their proposal. It draws no distinction between that and crimes that have been committed four years ago. An apology, Madam Speaker, Mr Speaker, both of you, wonderful people. <laughs> <laughs> Only judges. <laughs> Who's got the casting vote? <laughs> Madam Speaker. <laughs> what we say is that colonialism which brought civilization to its survivors is something which we 
don't feel a need to apologise for. Let us leave history... Yes, obviously. <laughs> Let's leave history to the historians. Let's leave reparations for crimes to war crimes tribunals and international courts. And let's leave self-serving apologies and group therapy to people who want to do it. They don't speak in our name because we, as a people of the world, have nothing to be ashamed for, for being the survivors of people who did wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And now I'd like to call to the podium the Deputy Prime Minister Ridian for seven minutes. Okay, thank you very, very much for the floor, Mr. Speaker. What we're going to do for you today is we're going to show you just why Neil, whilst accusing us of wonderful rhetoric, has given us nothing more than that to himself. We're also going to look at what the real problem is with not apologising. The problems with developing the post-colonial world, which Neil imagined somehow by apologising we were then excluding from everything we would ever do. We never said, Neil, I don't know if you missed this bit, we never said we will apologise and then refuse all aid to the developing nations. We said it's a good thing to apologise because it's nice to be nice. <laughs> but I'm going to look at Neil's arguments first of all. And when I came downstairs, I thought, I'll, I'll dress up for this, it's a show debate. And I'm very pleased to see that so many members of the opposition decided to take my lead. Um, because imitation is truly the sincerest form of flattery. <laughs> but what we don't want them doing, ladies and gentlemen, is imitating our mistakes in the past. And this is what they persist in doing. When they tell us that this is inappropriate and invites cycles of apology, we say, well, no, Neil, that's just a little bit silly of you. We say it's perfectly possible to say that Britain today is obviously the successor state to the Britain that colonised Africa. We say it's a little bit more difficult for you to claim that modern Greece is the modern is the, still the legitimate successor to the Persian Empire and therefore should possibly apologize to Macedonia. We say that's ridiculous. We say that the point with Zimbabwe we're going to deal with when we talk about the problems of post-colonial development and the reason why dictators like Mugabe and like Charles Taylor in Liberia were able to use neo-colonialist arguments for their own ends to maintain their own illegitimate power. We're going to deal with this point about it's insincere, and we say, well, only if you say it insincerely. If you actually mean it, an apology does an awful lot of good, because it doesn't take us down the road of reparations and war crimes. It avoids that. We're talking about reconciliation. They want blame, punishment, and persistent guilt. We think we've got the better option for you. We say it's not ill-directed because we say there is nothing that says once we apologise we still can't have crappy concerts like Live Aid, we still can't <laughs> give aid to Africa, but we do say on this point that if we give that aid to Africa because we've got white guilt, we then shouldn't be taking twice as much back in debt repayments at the same time. That's the insincerity of the opposition. We say it's not ill-advised. We say it's about the best single gesture that we can make towards these people, to hold our hands up and say, ladies and gentlemen, we were wrong. We accept now that what we did was wrong. We cannot go back and redraw all the boundaries because that is neo-colonialist. We cannot say, it was our mistake, let us come back in, we promise not to steal any more of your natural resources. No, thank you. But we can admit that the actions of our forefathers and the actions from which we have so tangibly profited were themselves so morally abhorrent that nothing less than a full, frank, and yes, Neil, sincere apology will do. And I'll take over. But don't you agree that if you actually go about, about apologising, then guys like uh, Mugabe and Zimbabwe are going to use that no, against no. us? No, sit down. That's the point. When we don't apologise and we say to Zimbabwe, we need to help you, what does Mugabe stand up and say? He says, don't trust these people. They still haven't bloody well apologised for the last 200 years of pain, of suffering, of degradation and of death that they brought to this country. He uses that argument against us. We want to take that power away from him. 
and we really don't see why opposition has such a problem with us doing that. We think actually, when you say to countries like Zimbabwe, when you say to countries like Liberia, do you know what? It's not the fact that you can't manage your own economies. We're partly responsible. We still bear the blame for some of the problems with post-colonialism. But we are not going to let somebody like Mugabe hijack the argument anymore, paint us solely as the bad guys who show no remorse and whose only agenda in purporting to try and help Zimbabwe now is to get back in there so we can revert to the bad old ways. Neil. Populations who feel responsible are the same ones who are pressuring their governments for more aid. If you stop them feeling responsible by allowing them to feel better about themselves... Neil, 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 no, no, them Neil, no, Neil, sit down now. There is nothing in our model that says you apologise, therefore you bear no more responsibility. This isn't a whitewash apology that they're trying to paint it as, ladies and gentlemen. This is an admission of the guilt, and it's a very public one. Why they can't see that, we don't know. But they can't. But we bet the people in those post-colonial nations will see what it is. We bet that if we go to them sincerely and say to them, we want to help you without any preconditions. We're not expecting any quid pro quo anymore for the aid that we're going to give you. We don't want to give you HIV, retroantiviral drugs, South Africa, because we want to undermine the Tarbo and Becky regime. No, we want to do it because we recognize our responsibility for causing some of those problems. We don't think that's that difficult to understand. So we think that taking away the argument from people like Mugabe that this is all neo-colonialism when we try to give aid to Africa is one of the most important things we can do. We say that the best way we can help the, the, the post-colonial world, the developing world now, by showing this remorse, by asking that forgiveness, means that we can then show that current aid is unconditional. It means we can deal with problems like AIDS epidemics, like the general health of continents like Africa. We can deal with education and we can deal with it in a far better way than the difficulties of post-colonial education which we see today. Because we resent the fact, or we see nations resenting the fact, that schools are still taught in English, that they are still taught British history in the middle of Africa. We say, us apologising and say, you know what, you can also teach the bad bits, that's fine. We say that all our other gestures look far more legitimate because of one simple act of apology. We say that this affects, as my partner has already told you, a form of reconciliation. We say the worst thing that we could do is continue down a route of blame, of continuing to try and find some form of punishment. The longer we go on without apologising for what we did, and we did do it, ladies and gentlemen, make no mistake about that, the longer we go on without acknowledging what we did, the louder the calls for reparations become. The louder the calls for punishment becomes. The louder the calls for vengeance becomes. We don't think that's the way you heal the world. We think that in South Africa they decided that blame and punishment was counterproductive. They managed to produce a very successful nation that healed incredibly quickly. We'd like to heal the rift between the developed and the developing world. We say the best way to do that, ladies and gentlemen, is apologise. Thank you very much for that. And now I'd like to recognize the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Branca, to speak for seven minutes. opposition. Well, we just wanted to apologize for, to the USA for having such a tremendous and horrible experience under the British colonizers. And he just wanted to like, put his words out there and wanted to share his feelings. But we also want to tell you that apologizing today does not mean a squat to the Americans that lived under the British colonization. What we want to ask you today in this debate on the side of the opposition is two main questions. First of all, who are we at this moment? Because we still haven't heard, heard a clear stance from the proposition. Who are we that we are apologizing? And who are we apologizing to? Because we have heard only that China is the best thing that ever happened to the world, that China did not no harm. And we haven't heard exactly the tangible person who we need to apologize. Now, we love that the Britain actually came to our playing field and stayed in the Britain, but we also need to recognize the fact that we do not have a clear definition from the side of the proposition that who are we addressing to. Second question is, 
Are we doing the right thing? And is our message reaching the people that it should be actually it should be actually reaching? Is it coming across? Now, what we on the side of the opposition are claiming is the mere fact that this is not reaching the, reaching the victims and it's not sending the message across. What it actually does, it legitimizes situations such as Mugabe in Zimbabwe saying, see, I told you they're colonizers. See, I have a right to legitimately say that the colonism is an excuse for do so. What we say that legitimizing situations like that does not yield to uh, peace, love, and unity, what the proposition wants to claim us. What it actually yields to is the claim and the punishment issue. What we on the side of the opposition claim and firmly say that if you want to have an apology, it needs to be, no thank you, sincere and demonstrated. What we say that this apology at this moment for the for the crimes that were perpetrated in the past is ill directed. And we want no thank you. And we want to say on the side of the opposition is the basic and mere fact that you're not reaching to the people that this message should be reached to. Yes. You claim that our apology will make the blame punishment culture worse. That blame punishment culture already exists. They already blame us. They already want to punish us. Show us how not doing anything makes that better. What I'm saying with the apology, what you are actually is legitimizing and you're not solving the problem. You still have the blame and punishment in fact. No, thank you. What in action you do have is more situation appearing. What you're actually doing is a kind of a free market solution. No, thank you. What you're actually giving them is money and the reparation claims for do so. Now, we want to see why the reparation, no thank you, reparation claims, but we do believe in an apology should be made is a situation why healing such situations should in effect hit the people that are affected. Now, coming to my arguments, what we want to say on the side of the opposition is basically the historical issue, where do we stop? Ladies and gentlemen, we have a, we have a simple question that we ask over and over to the proposition side, yielding them to actually answer the question, who are we? Uh, who are we actually hitting? And are we getting across as hypocritical? But well, the side of the opposition clearly demonstrates that actually what we, in fact, no thank you, are doing are perpetrating more scorn, no thank you, and perpetrating legitimized reasons why these nations should feel colonized and should actually yield to the colonization, no thank you, argumentation and rhetorics they're doing today, no thank you. What we want to do is the clear analysis, no thank you, of a population effect. What I want to analyze in this situation is A, are we affecting the population of the nation which apologizes? Now, what Neil has stated during the point of, argument, the point of information is stating to you that in order to have a population respond to certain issues, it needs to feel a little responsible. What we believe on the side of the opposition no, thank you, is that guilt trips actually work. What we say in this situation that when you have a popular demand and when you have a, a pu public pressure in this situation, it yields more help and it yields more aid. No, thank you. And we have seen that in the African example. No, thank you. What we also see in these examples is that the countries and the population are actually pressuring their governments to solve the situation and actually, actually pressuring their governments to have situations sorted in a way. What we see with an apology is basically saying, okay, we did wrong, sorry guys for that deal with it on your own, deal with your trash. What we say is that not a situation like this should be made public. Moving to the population, no thank you, population in the nation which is actually affected by the apology. First of all, we have to ask ourselves the question, A, is this message coming across as the right message? As again, I'm saying that it legitimizes rhetorics. Second of all, the countries, the people in that country may feel scornful of, on the hypocritical stances that the, that the country which apologizes actually made. And third of all, it can increase the tension and dislike to the apologizing nation. What we say on that, no, thank you. What we say on that, what we say on that fact, in order to have a right apology, make amends in situations that it needs to be tangible. No, thank you. Now, Tuna told us, let's all hug, love, and hold hands. And Britain kind of went into rhetorics of, okay, maybe we should pay them. Now, we would just like the proposition to perhaps decide which kind of line of argumentation would they like. Just apologizing, no thank you, or, or paying, paying the price also, no thank you. Now, moving to the guilt trip works. 
No, thank you. <laughs> what we see at the current situation is a tangible benefits for the countries of the former colonizing system. But before that, I'll love to take yes. Will you accept that if people take guilt trips and see that things are wrong, that there still is something to be responsible for and that we should apologize? How what do we, we get this? What we see on the situation that guilt trips and apologies sometimes work better if, there, if there's a reparation on it. We have seen that Germany has done it in a situation when you apologize and pay for it. What we see on the side of the opposition basically saying, let's apologize and maybe it will go away. Yeah. On we side of the opposition believe that it will not go away of just saying we're sorry. Although we do believe that sorry seems to be the hardest word in this question, we also say it should be made with a bit of money. Now, what? <laughs> What if the basic issue is the message that we're actually trying to, trying to make. What we say is that actually it undermines situations as the current system. We do believe that guilt and punishment sometimes work through the international institutions such as ICC and ICPY or ICPR. We do believe that ad hoc tribunals are the place to settle it and are the place to get the truth out. We believe that apologizing will not make amends and apologizing will not make anything come about if we do not have a sincere and demonstrated apology. And for all these reasons, I beg to propose this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, and now we will move to the second table debates, and from Team uh, Marshall Plan, we'll recognize the member of the government, Sam. Ladies and gentlemen, Madam Chair Creature, it is with great pleasure <laughs> that I actually get a chance to speak. I've stood up many times, not called on, and now finally you get to hear my voice, and I have a lot to say. First of all, I was reminded of one of my favorite quotes by Albert Camus, winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature. He said, human beings are not rational, they're rationalizing. I hadn't thought about that quote for some time. And then let me quote the first government. Thank God for colonialism. They brought civilization to its survivors. <laughs> oh, that, that made me really think of that quote from Camus. Human beings are not rational, they're rationalizing. They do what they do, and then they use their mighty processing skills of the brain that is bestowed upon them to figure out why it was okay. <laughs> well, what the government is saying is it's not okay. It's not okay to get up here and make jokes and say it is fine for us to rape and steal and plunder. My colleague from the University of Vermont made this point clearly and it was ridiculous. Yes, brilliant. I do not fear you. <laughs> say that we think that people who've committed crimes in the last 20 years should, rather than just having an apology, go to jail for it, and then you accuse me of bad I'm jokes to make your speech. How do you live with yourself? I, <laughs> I live with myself fine because I understand the nature of apology and you seem not willing to do that. What an apology is, and I'm glad you brought this point up, is a two-way street. It not only affects the person receiving the apology, but also affects the person giving the apology. The first step you have to do when you suffer from any ism, whether it be alcoholism or colonialism, <laughs> you have a problem. This constant state of denial that you bring up, he brings up these five eyes. I was waiting for ignorance. <laughs> I thought he said the same thing, the same thing, because he brought up the word ill. I was the only person getting ill here, whether I feel ill-directed or ill-advised. The whole entire argument was sickening. And the reason the argument was sickening was at its root, what he was saying is, it is okay to plunder. It is okay to exploit. It is okay to pretend it never happened. Now, he uses his mighty processing skills, but yes, please. I, I believe, I like the sentiment, but tell me, what is the concrete benefit of a country of apologizing to them? Oh, 
you're getting to my new matter, and I might as well jump to that right now. This is the extension that I'm making this argument. I think the question that needs to be answered is the question, what does an apology do to that, that the person that proffers the apology, to the individual or country that offers the apology? It does several things. First of all, it stops the denial, which is the first step necessary for any sort of real self-reflection or hearing. Second of all, it stops the self-deception, which we've seen so well ex exercised in this very debate, that it's been okay. We've actually done some good. Not very low beneath the skin is this idea. It might have been bad. It's insecure to try to fix it, but it really wasn't that bad of a thing anyway. In fact, it might have been beneficial. So it doesn't take a lot of genius, of ingenuity, another I word, but ingeniousness, to figure out what the real agenda is here. The real agenda is it's okay for us to do what we have done. This is what Cameron warned us about. That we are not, we are rational beings. We are not rational beings, we are rationalizing beings. Now let me get to some of the specific argumentation now um, that I have to deal with. And I'll, first of all, um, I think I've addressed the problem with the eyes. And the main problem is if you were to group all of his arguments, there's an A that overshadows all of them. And that A is arrogance. That it was all right to do this. And you want to know why it's all right? Don't ask the victims. Ask me. Ask me. I, I believe it was all right. Ask the conquering countries whether it was all right. They believe it's all right. And so that's the problem with the first government speech. The problem with the second government speech is she does not believe that there is such thing as a genuine policy. She is, makes such a jaded argument. You would think that in her life she had never experienced any real tenderness. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm not attacking her personally. <laughs> is pointing out that on this side, we are certainly about something called sincerity. And sincerity, I know it seems to your jaded minds like this could not exist, but sincerity is something that happens when you really care. Now, earlier in one of my speeches, I talked All about the concept, uh, yes, please. Okay. All, okay. All at once. It's the concept <laughs> of saying sorry, something is, that is supposed to put water under the bridge. No. Something that okay. is a by God. This shows, and you want that to happen. I'm glad you brought that up because this shows a central point to our argument. We believe that apologizing is a process. Yes. The first step of the process is to admit that you've done wrong and offer a sincere apology. Then you can do other things. Then you can offer reparations. Then you can come up with other solutions. Then you can have dialogue. Then you can have some of the advantages that the first government talked about. They don't understand this. They think an apology is say you're sorry and then walk the other way. Say you're sorry is the first part of a new relationship, of a new understanding, of a new mindset, of a new way of viewing the world and of a government out. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And now I'd like to recognize the member of the opposition, Lok, to speak for seven minutes. you 
two extensions. The first extension is the good things left behind by colonials. Not, as they characterize it, war mongers who kill and exploit and so on. So those people stayed 50 years, 150 years in my country and left good things in my country. Secondly, I'm going to use the Japanese model of not apologizing, but really giving you money and help to the Thais, <laughs> to Vietnam, to Cambodia, and Laos. To prove to you that there are another way to go about it, rather than giving hot air and feel good factor. <laughs> so let me just deconstruct the case of the opening government first. Opening government, I, my, my deepest apology to Tuna. Tuna, according to Nelson's speech, has used too much of pay toss. Meaning that it's appealed too much to our emotion. We must apologize. We must do all this good thing. Yeah, we agree to, with you. I apologize to my wife every day. And <laughs> <laughs> before I left home, I apologize to my son too for leaving him for the ne next three weeks. So I did that. But what is the gain of that to my son and wife if I don't return and become the husband and the son? Mm. So there need to be some concrete things. So we say to you, Having an apology and making them is mere hot air. If you did not tell, tell us who is going to do it, who is going to do it to, and how are we going to do it? Typical question you must set up as a policy maker from the first government. So let me assume to you, okay, everybody will apologize to China. I'm China now, sorry China. Okay. <laughs> how are we going to do it? Is he going to do it in just an informal way which nobody recognizes? Or are you going to do it at the United Nations Assembly? Or are you going to do it when I'm hosting the Olympic in August 8, like 2008? When are you going to do it? I, I really apologize on behalf of Tuna for setting such a loose case and for us to win the debate so easily. No, thank you. <laughs> so, all the good things that we have taught you, he has not used. So, my apology is that both him and Redin has given you a very beautifully emotional speech. Based on pathos, maybe based on a lot of ethos, because both of them are colonizers. American colonizers of the Indians and the UK, my country. So maybe they have some credibility, the ethos, to say that colonists should apologize. But I, as a, colon, a colonist, yeah. colonized person, feel differently. I'm, we must, I must take this case to you. Then let me deal with, no thank you, let me deal with Nick, uh, Sam. Sam, please note, the adjudicator have shifted a little the stand yeah, of the first yeah, case. Yeah. He said, now that the apology is the first step, yeah, yeah. after that, there can be many things that follow. Which was not the case was set up by Tuna or Redian. So please take note that there is a case shaft from the lower house to the upper house. So this is called teaching the adjudicator how to think. <laughs> <laughs> so what did he say? Okay, the extension was very clearly. He said, okay, uh, ex it, it reduced the strong denial of colonized, the colonizer to the country. Now, I, as a fourth 16 generation of people who have been colonized don't feel that British, British has harmed me anymore because countries and nations have short memories. What they do is they always look forward, they always look to the head, how they can gain from the international relations they have in the jungle of international politics. They don't care about the past if and unless the past gives you some gain. And we say to you, the apology in that way do not give any gain to the Colonies are to the colonized country. Yes, sir. You talked about tension between the upper and lower half of the government bench. Neil said opening the way to reparations was disastrous. Branca said we have to pay reparations. Which one of those two do you agree with? Okay, he's shouting words in my mouth. That's bad. It's called raping. <laughs> <laughs> I never said reparation. I said developmental aid, the Japanese model, which I'll enunciate later. No, thank you. And then. Sam said, okay, it will stop self-deception. Yeah, self-deception maybe of the, those great-great-great-grandparents of Aridian and Tuna, but not now. So that, we have no problem uh, loving the British. <coughs> no problem loving the American too. So our generation don't care, sincerely. And I have Japanese friends, no thank you. Japanese students who don't know that their father, forefather, actually killed my uncle. And this is the truth. And rape my mother's mother's mothers because they use our great grandmothers as comfort women. 
do we care? We trade with Japan and China, Singapore and Japan is the greatest uh, trading partner. Now let me get back to my extension quickly. <laughs> what have colonialism gave to us all these years? Hundreds of Singapore, Malaysia, Kenya. They've given us what we call the best way of running a country, the civil service, with, with or without the politician involved. <laughs> Secondly, they give us what we call the basic, most fundamental law called the English law, which gives you law and order and the basis to establish a good country. And we are very, very, very honored and very, very happy to have done that. And then we have what we call the parliamentary system, which Singapore has. So we say to you that those are the governance that are our order. The governance instrument they left to us, and we say, yes, they have done us some good for all those years to be lost, 150 years to reside in Singapore. Then they give us two precious things, English. And they give us the idea that religion is not something to be shunned. So we say to you that on those basis, the apology should not carry any weight. Secondly, we say to you that the Japanese conquered and colonized most part of Asia. But in, in the way they, although they have never apologized to Asian countries, except Singapore, which is first world country, so they didn't give <laughs> any aid, they've given aid to Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. For what? For technical, economic, technological, and human resource development transfer. And we say that is a better way for the country to re-establish a relationship with the former colonial country. And we say to you, apology is hollow. Don't say sorry to me. Give me some mola. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to recognize the government whip, Jens, to conclude the debate for the government bench. Seven minutes. gentlemen. As Camus has held, human beings are not rational, but they are rationalizing. We have taken this a step further in saying, this does not only apply to individuals, but it also applies to nations. And we have just seen here, as the third speaker of the opposition, a typical case of the Stockholm Syndrome, in which the victim sympathizes with the person that has held them captive for a long time, and taking all those things as friends and as accepted on the backs of hundreds of thousands of deaths, and we are simply saying, this is not acceptable. I have been last week invited to the British Embassy in Berlin, and we had a little debating session there, and after that, they gave me a nice little cup. When I looked at it, and said, it's original China from Britain. And I thought, this is really interesting, because now you can have actually a nice cup of English, Indian Darjeeling in this, as to further reap the benefits of the colonization for the British. We say this is wrong, they should pay up to it, everybody should pay up to it, and actually there's no problem in everybody apologizing for what they've done, because we finally recognize on the proposition side that history is a mess, we admit to that, and we think we should start sorting this mess out, and the best way to do this is by apologizing for it. I would like to sum up this debate in three major steps, and we do a little quick pro quo, you didn't t t take my point, so I'm not going to take yours, please sit down. <laughs> the first point is, as we have proven to you, a bad past warrants for a bad future, and we say the first step to go about this is an apology. I'm secondly going to talk to you about the nature of the apology, because quite clearly opposition has not understood what this means. Apology, people, does not mean absolution. It's the first step, it's not the last step, and it's a step into a better future. And thirdly, we're going to talk about the effects of an apology, and we say it's going to have good effects because follow-up measures are there, and there has no big inconsistency whatsoever on this side of the bench. What do you have to say to that? If you say it's the first step, your first government should have told us how the first step will be followed, many other steps that will make things different. Tell us now if you can. Oh, I will. That's my third point, actually. Um, and if you talk about shafting, right, the first bench on your side was all about, oh, they're going to demand all these reparations, and they're going to look back into the past and say what has been wrong, whereas you have been asserting all the time that nations don't look back, but they only look forward. So we see a much bigger shaft on your side here. We're going to get back to that. The first point was a bad past warrants for a bad future, because we've heard from Uber, for instance, that why should we care about what has been done, done wrong in the past? And that's been proven by first proposition here, that it still goes on today. It was actually 
actually it was taken as granted by the first opposition because they said if you do these guilt trips people see what has been done wrong they feel sorry about this and they pressure their governments into doing something about it so we say this is actually where it should be headed and that the states admit to the wrongs of the past and start dealing with it this boils down to a very practical level in neo-colonialism where Charles Taylor, Taylor and the likes of them all say, look at the bad colonial powers, it's their fault that something going wrong, so don't blame me for all the wrong I'm doing. We say the first step would be to say, okay, listen, we're sorry for this, how can we help you? And by the way, please stop slaughtering your people. We really don't like this. It's not a good idea, don't do it, because otherwise, you might be the one to issue an apology in the past, and probably you're not going to be there for it. Please be seated. And I want, just want to repeat again what Locke has just said, because it has been a pure assertion, and he didn't give us any meat on this, that he said, oh, countries don't worry about the past, countries never look back, they only look forward all the time. And we say they haven't given us any sort of mechanism why this should be true, and this is clearly against any sort of circumstantial evidence we're going to find in trying to sort out the history of what has gone wrong, and me as a German belief, I have a lot of experience in that. Neil, what's your point? But exactly. How can an apology for something like the British running America and something like the Germans and the way they ran Poland be morally equivalent? It's not a moral, it's not a question of moral equivalency, and I'm still not at the effect of the apology. I want to first talk about the nature of the apology because I think that then we can all understand how this is going to help in, in dealing with the individual guilt, if there's such a thing, of a nation. Because as I said before, Opposition has constantly mistaken the idea of an apology as something as if, an, if it was an absolution. And we say this is simply not true. It doesn't close the case, it actually opens the case. It makes it open to discussion and admits that something has been done wrong. And we say, of course, there will be follow up measures. Of course, then there will be demands for reparations, which they are so terribly afraid of that they won't admit for this. And we say, also, we should, of course, offer them sincere help in nation building. That's a big problem, of course, especially in Africa, right? The case went fine in America. We say there's probably not so much of a case to build the nation there. But talking about Africa, there actually is, right? And all the things we screwed up there, because we didn't respect their individual cultures and the way they dealt with things, and just imposing uh, razor lines uh, all across the country, is a really bad thing, and we should help them in doing this. And this, of course, is a process. And what we're saying here, the nature of apology is actually something that Branca has brought to the table. It is, sorry seems to be the hardest word. No nation has apologized so far. They all fear the things that are going to happen later. We say we shouldn't fear this. We should accept this and go from there. And it is actually the hardest work because we know there's a lot of work in front of us, right? And we have to make up for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people. And we say, that's the way to go. This is what we should do. And this finally brings <coughs> to the effects of an apology. Because there's been quite some waffling inside opposition. First, Neil said, if everybody apologizes, it's not going to have any effects at all because everybody has to apologize to somebody. Then moving along and saying, this is actually not true because then there might be all these reparations and people might actually remember about the horrible things that happened to them. We say, this is inconsistent, we need to start dealing with the thing. And it's about breaking the state of denial. We have to admit that wrong principles have been applied in the past. And as debaters, we all know how important principles are. And that history marches to the, to, the, to the drum of great ideas, right? And that we all follow these principles. So accepting that our principles were wrong in the past is harder than to say, OK, here, have a little money. And now let's just quickly look at this example of Germany. Because we say, firstly, Germany has apologized. And I, we believe, I at least believe, that the German government and the German people are genuinely sorry. Then we have paid our dues and we've tried to set up funds. It may not be enough, but we've tried it. And look at it, we're still a rich country, so it has not ruined us so far. And, now, and the third thing is, and this, is, this has been failed by opposition all along, that we have not demanded reparations ourselves for the people that were driven away from the formerly eastern, eastern countries. So we say, it's actually a thing countries can choose, and if we accept this, then we're going to go about it. So what have I shown you? Firstly, a bad past warrants for a bad future. Secondly, the nature of apology is not absolution, but looking into the future. And second, thirdly, the effects of an apology are a good one. So we, shall, so we say, the Marshall Plan is won, and apologies are accepted. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and I'd like to recognize the opposition whip, Uwe, to finish the debate for the opposition. Ladies and gentlemen,
gentlemen, I guess I'm one of the few people in this debate who is not from a country that has colonized, that has been a colonizee or whatever the word is, I've just been occupied. So I'm in a good position to talk about this. <laughs> but the thing is, what the whole proposition bench has been trying to convince, convince us of is that colonization is the same as genocide and other atrocities. Now, in the minds that are, you know, you're, 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 in your minds that are properly indoctrinated by our Western moral values of having been nice for all the time, this may make sense. I'm, as of now, going to prove you off the opposite. I'm going to sum up this debate on two accounts. I'm going to tell you about the reconciliation process, and then I'm going to tell you about the benefits of colonialism, which are tangible. Now, the first thing that I pointed out in my point of information, and that you know, eventually became a big thing to talk about, is whether saying sorry is, is absolution or, or, or not really, whether there is more to go. And then the other thing that we talked about is that whether we, as successors of the guilty, should pay for that of our forefathers. We outside of opposition believe that this is not the case. We don't exactly see how we are going to get to reconciliation if we are going to say sorry. But if you guys are going to use quantum physics for that, I don't exactly see that. We have a couple of other ideas against that. Well, first of all, tell you that welcome to the 21st century. We are way beyond the era where the, where the sons paid for the debts of their fathers. This is not going on anymore. We are the rational actors who are, who are responsible for our own behaviors and, and whatever our forefathers did is, is not our concern in that sense. Yes, we are sorry for all the you know, horrible things that, that, that happened, all the exploitations, etc., etc., but this is up to an individual, not up to a state to decide. Other people may not be sorry because they don't feel any blood on their hands for what our grandfathers did 400 years ago. No, thank you. We also say that why should we take the hit? Why should we feel the pain? Especially in case the victims actually don't feel that bad about it. What Loeb told you, the victims in Singapore don't really feel bad about it. The fact that I'm Estonian and Sherman occupied Estonia for 700 years doesn't make me feel, uh, feel hate towards uh, Jens here. So there's no victim food anymore left in those countries. No, thank you. So, so, so sort of like, get over it, guys. <laughs> now, the other thing I have to tell you is, is about the notion of, pay, of saying sorry. Now, to my understanding, yes, saying sorry is about absolution, as is uh, the concept of carrying out a, a, a punishment or, or a con conviction. No, thank you. Uh, Gates, uh, yes, somehow has been saying that, no, it's not absolution, we still have more obligations, but isn't that the complete opposite of, of what we think about? Whenever you say sorry to your friend or to your girlfriend for having cheated on her, you believe that she's going to forgive you on a permanent basis. This is not supposed to be a chat anymore. Whether she does that or not is her own problem, but you have asked for more forgiveness, and if that has been forgiven, then that is water under the bridge. There are no sort of future uh, actions that we should be concerned about, and that they all of a sudden come to this uh, table and change that concept. Yes. Don't you agree that an apology begs for acceptance, and therefore it's not just the thing you say, but something that is between the two parties? No, I don't. <laughs> happen if we are going to say sorry? What is going to, uh, you know, Mr. Mugabe from Zimbabwe, he's going to say that, look at them now, they're apologizing, I was right all along. Yeah. Countries such as Zimbabwe are going to use their whole propaganda apparatus against the former colonizers uh, and, and sort of prop up support from their own, own uh, uh, populations to do anything against the Western world. No, thank you. Also, what is important is that this becomes a good source of asking for these reparations that uh, the proposition is sort of trying to deny here, but in case we do it legitimize, uh, or we, in case we do admit that, admit that we were guilty on a sort of a state level, and we as sex successor are also guilty, then they're going to uh, use that against us. So, so I don't like that. No, thank you. Now, thirdly, what I need to say is that drawing attention to the issue of colonization is only going to institutionalize, institutionalize the guilt and pour salt or, or put salt on the wounds that are actually now healing. Let's take a look at what, ha what happened in the U.S. recently when the Armenian uh, minority or um, Armenian group was trying to ask for, uh, for the U.S. Congress to vote on an approval that the uh, uh, Turkish genocide towards Armenians was actually there and denial of such things to, should be criminalized. We saw that uh, Turkey went berserk. And why did it go berserk? For something that happened 100 years ago. Yes, they went berserk for, for a reason. We don't want to do that again. No, thank you. And drawing uh, attention to that issue is exactly that. 
And my fourth problem with reconciliation is that if you actually launch this avalanche of apologies, what is going to happen? I think each and every one of these apologies is going to look like one US dollar, and that's the end of that. <laughs> now moving on, what are the benefits of colonialism? Now, yes, we can see the side opposition. There have been things that, you know, went a little bit wrong. Uh, sure. But now I uh, will really need to tell you that there is this paradoxical argument, Jens just told me that recently, uh, which, have, which tells you that while a lot of things went wrong, there are things that still were beneficial as well. And I think Loke is the great embodiment of that in our little uh, uh, yeah, sort of debate <laughs> camp. Yes. Isn't being thankful for the modern day benefits of the colonial past rather like when you're hit by a car, crippled for life, but then you'll go and give thanks to the guy who ran you down because you just won a Paralympics gold medal? <laughs> <laughs> by, I don't know, jumping 10 meters in length, then that is a whole lot more than Western countries can do nowadays. <laughs> and many other countries top these cool colonizers that were around earlier. Yes. So this is to show, this proves the point of view of uh, regional Paralympics, not there. However, we do see that we have lent a very positive legacy to many of the countries that we're talking about. Is it be it the, the rule of law, be it the infrastructure, be it, be it the, the sort of civil service we have in countries such as Singapore and, 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 and Hong Kong? These are actually good things. We have, we have also enabled trade to occur between uh, you know, the countries in the, in the Commonwealth, which is actually benefiting uh, all the countries in, in the group, which is a great thing. And I'm sorry that, you know, or I, I think that when we are ready to come out, out and about and say that, oh, we are so sorry for what's happened, then this is not going to quite cut it. The, what the people in those uh, colonized countries are going to perceive is that we are trying to wiggle our way out of this. We're going to try, trying to be the slick tricksters, but this is not the image we should, uh, or the p signal we should send out. We should send out real help, it be it in form of so, technology, tra the technology transfer, or developmental aid, or further trade, uh, trade, then this is what we need to do, not use fluffy words for self-serving interests. <laughs> Thank you everyone for an excellent uh, debate.